city of Carlsbad and the Department of Energy and being broadcast by Red Rocket over live stream. We have some guests here this evening that I'd like to introduce. Uh, we got Bernadette Granger with Congressman Steve Pierce's office, Diane Ventura with Senator Heinrich's office, Beverly Allen with Senator Udall's office, and Will Teeter with the New Mexico Environmental Department. The focus of today's meeting is going to be ground control. There have been a number of stories over the past few weeks about issues related to ground control, so it is certainly very appropriate to have this meeting today explaining and clarifying the process. It should be stressed that the Rock Falls took place in off-limits, barricaded areas where ground control is not currently occurring. We do not believe they presented a safety risk to personnel. RIP is located in salt for a reason, and that is that the salt does collapse. However, there has been some confusion and uncertainty over the past few weeks, which is why we appreciate WIP's interest in hosting tonight's meeting. Tim Lanyon with the Crosbad Field Office will be our moderator tonight. CBFO manager Todd Schrader will provide an update on the status of WIP. Our nuclear waste partnership, Phil Breidenbach, will deliver a status update on WIP ground control. As always, we will take questions at the end of the meeting first from audience members and then from the viewers online. We'll rotate questions and make sure everyone gets a fair chance. Thank you again and we look forward to a productive meeting. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor Janway. Um, I'm Todd Schrader, manager of Carlsbad Field Office. Uh, glad to be here tonight. As the uh, mayor said, this is a uh, special town hall we called. The, uh, the uh, uh, reason was to talk about ground control, and as we heard, and I think as you've read uh, in the paper, there's been uh, uh, a few incidences over the last um, three, four weeks. We want to explain uh, what happened, and more importantly, what we're doing about it. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, a lot about ground control tonight. We're going to show some rock bolts, that type of stuff. Um, I'm also going to talk to at the end about some of the uh, path forward that we're taking from that. But um, uh, in addition to the ground fall issues and, uh, that we'll talk about, uh, as you know, we're in the middle of readiness, uh, trying to, you know, working to try to get open by the end of December or in December. Um, we'll see if we get there, and if it takes a little bit longer, it takes a little bit longer. Um, so we'll start with an update on where we're going there. And so I'm going to change it just slightly, and Phil's going to talk about the update. Of, of where we are in readiness and some of the other things uh, in a brief discussion. And then we'll turn it over to John Vandekratz for uh, the in-depth discussion about ground control itself. So, Bill. Hi, my name is Phil Breidenbaugh. I'm the president and project manager at, at WIP. I got several things we'll talk about before we get into ground control. The first one I want to discuss with you is the interim ventilation system. This is a project that we've had in progress really for uh, close to two years and it has been completed. Uh, the DOA readiness assessment, which had to be done prior to this startup, it's what is done to allow us to start up a project like the IVS. Uh, was completed in August. Uh, it then started through a testing process where we uh, declared it operable in early September. Um, we completed testing in the underground with air going into the underground, doing air balancing, making sure that it operated and we understood the characteristics of, of that set of fans. Uh, was completed uh, in mid-September. Uh, we proved that we get 43,600 CFM, uh, that's an airflow measurement, 43,600 at what will be the waste phase when we uh, return to operation. Uh, and that's versus a requirement in the permit of 42,000. So uh, the system works as designed. Uh, and uh, we feel really good about it. It's been running well since that time. There have been no, really no issues with the system. Uh, and I can tell you when you go down in the underground, uh, you can feel the difference, and that's a good thing to feel. So we're very happy that uh, the interim ventilation system is in operation and working for us. We also successfully completed the management self-assessment. 
the startup process uh, within DOE is, is very robust, a lot of pieces to it, and, and we talk about it a lot of times, and I think sometimes uh, it's easy to get confused, but there's three independent assessments that we have to pass uh, in order for us to get approval to resume waste emplacement. The first one of those assessments is called the MSA, the Management Self-Assessment. Uh, it was completed August 15th uh, through the 26th. It's a two-week assessment. 16 independent assessors were on site for that two-week period. Uh, they reviewed 950 documents, uh, conducted over 200 interviews of uh, NWP and, and DOE employees. Uh, they uh, watched over 120 discrete activities as we executed those over that two-week period. At the conclusion of that assessment, they, they had identified five pre-start findings, uh, and I can tell you that uh, none of those pre-start findings were, were truly unexpected. We had identified those as not being done going into the assessment. In addition, that team of people identified 58 improvement items, uh, 58 improvement items that we uh, have closed many of and are continuing to work on, on closing others. And, and they identified eight noteworthy practices. Uh, I would, I, I feel really good about our team uh, based on their performance during that management self-assessment. Uh, I'd like to read three quotes from the report that that team uh, wrote uh, in the uh, in their final report. They said, the NWT workforce culture is strongly focused on safe performance of work. And the part about that quote that I like is the safe performance of work. That's important. They think about those words before they write them down and they spend a lot of time to, to come to that conclusion. They also said NWP personnel are competent, proficient, and appear ready to resume waste and placement operations. Another very strong conclusion for them to draw. And lastly, and I'll paraphrase this one, it's a little longer. Strong ownership was positively demonstrated uh, with the organization's ability to handle and resolve emergent issues which were observed as commendable and an indicator of a competent, resilient organization. Now, Believe me, there's a lot of things that I identified as, like I said, 58 improvement items that we need to continue to work on. We don't think we're perfect, but this was a good assessment for us, uh, and we, we, it gave us confidence to proceed and move forward. Uh, the MSA uh, went well, and that leads to three weeks later, uh, excuse me, about four weeks later, the contractor ORR. This is the second test that you have to pass. Uh, in order to resume waste emplacement. The contractor ORR again is made up of about 15 assessors. Uh, it'll, it's, it's in process now. It started October 3rd. Uh, it lasted for two weeks. They will do their out brief tomorrow. Uh, their out brief will include again identification of findings, identification of improvement items, and, and any noteworthy practices. We will put together the plan and the schedule to address any of those items that need, need to be resolved prior to uh, the, the DOE ORR, and uh, we will be working those over the next uh, two to three weeks. In addition to the uh, contractor ORR, we talk, we, we talk a lot about the uh, mine rescue team. WIP has an exceptional mine rescue team, two-time national champion mine rescue team. Uh, we also have a fire department and I was pleased and kind of excited and enjoyed going to a competition held in Carlsbad earlier this month uh, called the uh, National Combat Challenge. Uh, it had teams from all over uh, uh, the nation really uh, and they go through what you'd call an obstacle course uh, related to firefighting and I have to congratulate the Carlsbad uh, fire department. Uh, they're exceptional. I watched them do three runs and three times they came within a half a second of setting a national record. You don't get to see that very often. They're exceptional. The WIP team also did really well though and I'm very proud of them. Uh, they uh, bested their team time by four seconds in this one com competition. So they, they bettered their best time by four seconds. It was an excellent uh, event to watch and I would encourage anybody who gets a chance to go watch those to do that. 
I also wanted to talk about our, our new exhaust shaft. Uh, and this is really exciting also. The photograph uh, towards the, the right there, oops, right here, uh, looks like an empty field with dirt. Uh, that is, shows that site prep for where the new shaft is going to be located has begun. Uh, and in fact, that site prep uh, was finished uh, here earlier this week. Uh, that site prep, uh, the site is located just across the road from, from WIP, uh, is where the location is. Uh, core sampling uh, will begin in about two weeks. This is where you uh, start drilling a, a four inch core down to uh, 20, uh, a little over 2,150 feet. Uh, they expect that uh, core drilling to take about two months. In addition to a shaft, we have a new ventilation system that's being designed. That ventilation system, we received the 60% design complete uh, documentation, and it will now start its formal review process, uh, and that review will be taking place over about the next month or so. Uh, lots of progress. Uh, what, the met, what this session is focused on, though, is ground control. And I'd like to go ahead and just make a few uh, introductory comments. Uh, rockfall uh, is the single highest hazard to workers and to the mission at WIP. We know that. We recognize that. It's, it's of our highest priority, but it's not the only safety priority that we have. We worry about a lot of things. Uh, during the restart effort, we aren't doing mission work. We aren't receiving waste, we aren't moving waste, we aren't placing waste. Everything we do is focused on improving the safety of the site so that it can safely uh, conduct its mission. We work on things like fire protection, ventilation, safety management programs, a new safety basis, all of those things. But we work every single day and we think about ground control. Um, where where potentially unstable ground is found, and we do assessments every single day, and John is going to talk about that. Uh, where we find that kind of ground, we barricade that area and keep people away from it. Falls that have occurred uh, recently that you've maybe read about or heard about have all occurred in prohibited areas. These are areas that we barricaded off with a fence that we don't allow people in and that we had stopped doing ground control activities to try to save that ground. In those areas, you expect the ground to fall. Uh, and in this case, it did. Uh, I just want you to know that safety of our workers is paramount. Uh, and we're, uh, the work that we do uh, of the mine are uh, evaluated. We determine those to be safe prior to entry. If we don't think the ground is safe, then we don't let the people in. Now, I'd like to. Instead of listening to me talk about ground control, I'd like to introduce uh, John Vandekratz. John is a longtime resident of Carlsbad. He's got 25 years experience at WIP starting in 1985. Uh, he's both worked both on both sides, both the federal and contractor. Uh, he's got, uh, he spent six years as a ground control engineer and, and the balance of, of of his experience has been in managing various aspects of the of the mine. John's a degree geological engineer. He graduated from the New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology. Uh, that's a sister university of the one that I graduated from, the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology. Mine is better, but don't hold that against him. He really does know ground control. So, John, if you're willing to come up still, we'd love to have you. I'm not going to start out by uh, discussing uh, the South Dakota School of Mines, but <laughs> that's, uh, that may be a part point of discussion that we'll have after the meeting. Um, we're going to talk about ground control, and obviously uh, one of the things that we do is support the ground, but the reality is the thing that's probably most important and unique to WIP is the program that we have and the way we look at the ground and we can anticipate what might be able to, what might be happening, that sort of thing, and we monitor uh, real time, if you will, from a geologic standpoint, uh, what, what uh, goes on. And I'm going to talk a little bit about just you know, whip, whip geology. That's uh, hopefully everybody knows that, but I'm going to talk about that and, and how that 
ties into ground control, talk about uh, the stratigraphy and how we support different aspects of, uh, of the mine, and then uh, how we monitor and the instruments we monitor and how we monitor, uh, and then the results of that, the analysis of the data, and, uh, and then ultimately the actions that are taken to, uh, to control the ground or, or make sure it remains safe. <clears throat> hey, light, and that's uh, sodium chloride. That's the kind of stuff that you get out of your Morton salt shaker, uh, or the salt is, is formed usually as a, as a result of ocean water uh, evaporating. And what we had was the Permian Sea here, and uh, what's left in, is we have a, a wonderful deposit that the uh, scientists back in the 50s started looking for these possibilities for. Um, for repositories and we find that we have a, an ideal situation where we have about a half a mile worth of salt, uh, 2,000 feet or so, in this formation. It begins about 850 feet below the surface in all the shafts. And it's relatively flat, relatively level. Um, and it, the typical sequence, I guess I'll talk about the sequence in a minute, but the typical sequence, it, it's a, it, it follows a sequence of, of repeating halite, clay layer, and hydrite. And, and that's the typical thing you get. You may have some impurities, but that, that just repeats all the way through uh, this sequence. At that kind of depth, at 2,000 feet deep, and that's how deep we are, 2,180 feet at repository level, uh, salt will creep. It, it, the pressure, the lithostatic pressure, that's the term that's used, will cause that salt to creep and move. And that's, that's why, uh, it's one of the primary reasons why WIP is, is, is chosen, why salt was an ideal uh, media to put to put uh, nuclear waste in because it's going to flow in, creep. The idea is that when it completely seals up, it will seal that waste and encapsulate it for perpetuity, and it'll uh, isolate it from from any contact unless we have those those uh, well drillers or something in the in the four th four thousand years from now, those sorts of things. And you can see on that map the. Uh, the different salt deposits across the, the nation, uh, and most of them are bedded salt, but, but the ones down the Gulf are, are domal salt. And, and uh, uh, we just have an ideal situation where we're at right now. The stratigraphy of, of the whip site itself, as I said, it repeats. You see that the, the thickness there, the, the top is the, the surficial sands, basically what we have out there. And then there's a sedimentary uh, beds where there are some some uh, some shallow aquifers that uh, uh, are in there, and the Rustler Formation likewise, and then we go into that Salado Formation, which is basically all, all salt, and it it's evaporites, and basically what you have are feet thick halite beds or sodium chloride uh, that are topped by less than an inch to an inch of, of clay, usually this is typical, and then. Topped by that is an anhydrite. That's a calcium sulfate a mineral that's pretty brittle. Uh, and it's all part of the, the uh, evaporite sequence. And then it'll repeat. You'll have halite, clay, and, uh, and the uh, anhydrite. And so the way we've, we've cited at WIP, the way it was decided is we want to place that, that waste in one of those massive or thick uh, salt or halite beds. And that's what we do. Uh, is, and, we, and that's what we do in that. And I'm, <clears throat> okay, the, as I said, at that depth we have enough pressure, and it's, it's a lot of pressure at that depth, basically the rock is being pushed on at about 2,000 pounds per square inch, uh, a very high pressure, and so it creeps, and it's a, it's a, it's a depending on the size of the opening, um, the local geology, and, and the age of the opening, that those, those rates may vary a little bit. But initial, you have, you, when you first go in and mine, uh, you have a big response, but it settles down to this two to five inches per year uh, average. And uh, the intent, in, again, is for salt uh, to creep in, encapsulate the waste, and, and seal it away. And we have a video here that, uh, that illustrates that. It's a good, good uh, Sandia video from a few years ago, and it takes us through 10,000 years of uh, of the of the of the of the uh, waste room. Uh, go back. Double click. 
I'm not getting it. Yeah, hit the solid. Sorry, I've got too far up ahead. There we go. That's waste being in placed at the waste face. Drums on a tandem overpack, and then filling the room. You're seeing that sequence. And then the ears stick by, and you'll see the, the ground begin to move. That's the MGO bags breaking on top. Basically, it's crushing the waste stack at this point. Basically, continues to, to creep in until the pressure inside the room is equal to the pressure outside the room. So you have that to, the ability to stand up 2,000 pounds per square inch. So you'll consolidate and, and uh, encapsulate that waste. After we, uh, after we mine a room or mine a panel, uh, it, it, it's uh, incumbent upon us and it's required by us to maintain those openings. Uh, when you first mine, you may have to uh, beware of uh, thin scale spall areas and you may have to spot bolt that. Uh, and after, after some time, you'll see uh, development of of fractures near the, the openings, and that's typical of the creep process. There's nothing to hold it back, and so you'll see fractures that'll develop near the openings. And uh, that's the thing that we want to monitor and make sure that, that uh, we control so that uh, the ground remains stable and safe. And typically, uh, what we'll do there is we will we'll bolt, and that's what you see in the, uh, in the, uh, the, uh, photographs, slides on the side here. Roof bolter putting, they're drilling for a roof bolt in the roof. This is a, uh, a, roof, a, a bolter that's drilling and installing mesh on, on a rib or the wall. Uh, and that's to control those, those small fractures that develop. Then back over on the left, the ground control program, as I said, it's more than just going and bolting. You gotta have, you gotta have a plan. You gotta understand what's going on. Uh, we have inspections that are done. Uh, the inspections that are done are done by the operations folks, the personnel that, that uh, are required to go and, and work. They're also done by uh, the geotechnical engineering group uh, as part of their monitoring also. Those are, those are typically visual inspections. The next three little bullets there, instrumentation, data collection, and analysis, that's typically done by the geotechnical uh, engineering group. And they install instrumentation in these openings. The typical instruments, and, and I'll touch on those in just a minute, are closure instruments, and we will see, monitor how that ground is closing, how the creep is affecting the opening, and uh, and uh, and we look at the at the data to to see what uh, what that means. Um, they instrument it, and then they periodically collect data. They go out and. And some of the work is done by manual readings. They go out and, and actually hook up a tape extensometer and, and, uh, and read the, the closure. And the resolution of those instruments is about, a th I don't say it's about, it, it is a thousandth of an inch. Uh, so it's a very, very fine resolution. And then they, they bring that data together and uh, they have a, the geotechnical monitoring system and they um, put this data together in, into graphs, and they basically plot, many times will plot, uh, displacement versus time, and you'll see these plots here in just a minute. And in the end, uh, they'll, they'll, uh, they'll report those results, and, and we'll actually go in and uh, take action depending on what they see. <clears throat> As part of the inspections, that was the first bullet you saw there. I'll stop. There's a man scaling with a scaling bar. And yeah, I hit the solid. Go back to the drumming. I guess so. The point of that that video is is so that's in some cases that's the the uh, level of inspection that they do. Uh, the uh, the workers are required to um, do visual inspections, do inspections of their workplace at the beginning of their shift, and as any conditions uh, change during the shift. 
and that's typical of, of mining if you're if some some condition changes while you're mining since we're not doing mining right now most of those inspections are done at the beginning of the shift and if they enter an area that isn't bolted and we have some of those areas uh, it's incumbent upon them to make sure that they know what's up there and that's a typical thing that they will do is they will they will uh, sound the back and we may do this run through this again but but basically if the if the bolt or the scaling bar rings it it, it and i don't know what to, how to explain ring uh, as opposed to being hollow or drummy uh, that's where you know you have a, an area that is uh, it ha has a separation up there because if you have a separation you, the sound doesn't transmit well through that and so there you get a duller sound can we play that again? I'll, I'll try it here, but. Yeah, I hit the solid. Go back to the drumming. So you notice there at the end, as he moves over, you, you hear that more hollow sound, and that's, that's what he's doing. So they're looking, they're looking at the ground and making sure nothing's changed since the last time they were in there. That's the number one thing. If it's an area, particularly if it's not bolted, uh, it's incumbent to, to pick up a scaling bar or a, I like to use a, a rock bolt to sound the back and hear what you've got. And in some cases, you have to pick your way through those areas, making sure that they're safe. Typically, though, when we have a drummy area and it's an unbolted area, the response is to bolt that area. And that's usually done at the, at the crew level. They are trained and, and, and able to go and, and determine where to put the bolts and how to put them in. They don't have to worry so much about a pattern because these are typically small localized areas. The geotechnical inspections um, progress. And again, I, those, are, those are done by the geotechnical engineering group uh, for the contractor. And they install the, their instruments, and this is just showing the the, uh, the curiosity of, of uh, when they inspect. They typically will inspect the uh, the clean areas, those that are non-restricted and non-contaminated on a weekly basis, and the in uh, those areas that are contaminated, they will they go in uh, as needed, typically bi-monthly or bi monthly. And it'll be more, it'll be increased, the frequency will be increased if, if an area is being active and we want to monitor it uh, more closely. And so uh, those are done by, by the, the geotechs and, uh, and they're, they're probably the most experienced folks looking at ground control in the mine. <clears throat> those uh, non-prohibited areas, the accessible areas are, are, well, I should say, they are graded and so the geotechnical engineering in this case it's the ground control engineer and his group they go in and rent, look at all the uh, the openings not just the roof they look at the ribs and look at the floor and and they see what's going on in that and they, and they basically rank it as to as to where uh, uh, it is whether it's active or where it needs attention how much uh, how much monitoring needs to be done and uh, that gets reported in the uh, ground control annual plan and as uh, as necessary, these, those are the one I'm talking about are are scheduled period periodicities on uh, the ground control monitoring. Obviously, they if they have a special request, if the mine ops folks are doing one of their inspections, and they do as I say, beginning of shift inspections, but they also do inspections uh, throughout the whole mine on a weekly basis. Now, if there's any questions, they usually will call uh, the ground control engineer and ask the geotechnical engineering folks to go and, and look at and evaluate the area. And uh, in the end, uh, that's, that's part of, of the employee feedback uh, that we, we encourage and hope we, we get uh, from the folks. A little bit more about the instrumentation. Um, we have instrumentation installed throughout the underground at one point in time. I think we had over a thousand data data points or locations in the mine where we uh, uh, took measurements, and uh, because the mine, the footprint of the mine's gotten smaller with, with closing some of the panels and that sort of thing, we uh, we probably don't have quite that many, but we got close to a thousand, I'm sure, uh, right now. And so the the, the key take home uh, measurements are the convergence measurements and those that are taken by extensometers. The convergence measurements. 
there's a couple of, of different uh, data points that are, that are collected. The ones that are collected manually are typically a, uh, an eye bolt that is recessed into the roof or the back and into the floor. And, and the measure using a tapex insometer manually by hooking onto those eye bolts and, and measuring it under a, a, uh, a set uh, tension. And that's all set up in the instrument. And again, a measure to a thousandth of an inch. Uh, and then as you do that through time, uh, you can see uh, what that rate is. And uh, the typical installations are um, at the intersections on the mains, the north-south mains. And uh, those mains are about typically 300 feet apart. And so they divide that by four. Divided by two, that's 150 feet. Divided that again by two, and that's 75. And that's the interval. We have a quarter of each of the uh, intervals down through there, every 75 feet typically. And then the cross drifts that go across the mains, we typically are in the intersections again, and then in the bisector of the pillar. Uh, okay. Let's get you on the mic, John. So that the All right. Sorry, those on, on the video, I apologize. <clears throat> the mains that I'm talking about are the north-south drifts that run all the way north and south through the mine. And so these drifts typically, like the panel widths, are 300 feet apart. And so, as I said, on quarter points, 75 feet apart are where they install these, these uh, convergence points. And then across drifts, those drifts that are going across the mains, right, we have obviously the uh, instruments in the intersections, but we also have them at the bisector of the pillar, so halfway through. And that'll be typically, that'll be in the range of, of a 75 feet too in, in uh, most cases. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> as you get in the panels, we, we have those uh, at the intersections again, and at the bisectors, and these, these drifts, and in the rooms themselves, again, it's the quarter points, 75 feet apart. And that's the typical installation uh, uh, configuration for these. And uh, most of them are installed in the center of the room on the bisector, right in the center of the, the drift. But there are some uh, occasions where there, there's an array of, of uh, convergence points that we, we uh, measure. And we also measure horizontal uh, convergence also. So in that case, it's usually, it's not usually, it is the bisector of the setup at the bisector from the roof and the floor. And they measure across and measure that convergence. Again, the, the measurements are typically made on a monthly or bimonthly uh, basis. And uh, they may be increased if you have an active area that you're concerned about. You see some activity or some change. You may want to uh, measure it uh, more frequently, and we do so. Extensometers are um, instruments that are installed in the rock itself. And typically these extensometers are installed in the roof at the, at the center point in the, in, the, in the bisector of the room. Uh, and they, uh, they, they are anchored into a borehole that's drilled into the roof. Uh, those, and this, this talks about a 25 foot, uh, actually it doesn't. So yeah, typically it's a 20, 25 foot uh, deep hole that's drilled in the rock. And then there's anchors that are placed key to the stratigraphy. They'll place them above that next clay layer so you see what is, is up on the solid. You'll place another anchor that's just below that uh, uh, anhydrite and clay area. And, uh, and then you'll have one maybe at five feet. And then you, these, these are measured. Uh, and so we see those, 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 we measure the dilation of the roof that way. Many of these uh, instruments are, are read uh, remotely. You can, re you can read those from the surface on any period curiosity you want, but it's typically uh, on a bi-monthly bi or monthly basis. And then we listed uh, crack meters also. As we have cracks developed, that's the fractures I talked about earlier. <clears throat> um, the, uh, as they dilate, as they open up, we may measure the the frequency of, of their uh, or their their movement. There's other uh, there's other instruments too that I'm not mentioning, but uh, these are the these are the workhorses, if you will, of, of the uh, geotechnical group and, and what they measure. 
There's others like load cells, and those can measure the load on a, on a, uh, a rock bolt, uh, for instance, or the load on some structure that's, uh, that's placed in the underground and, and is uh, being uh, loaded by the, by the ground itself, by the creep. Okay, that's where I got the. There's a couple of plots there, and I I, I have my uh, what I just explained there. I guess <clears throat> the uh, the plots that you see, and obviously they're small and hard to to uh, to read. But in the case of the one on the left, the case that went on the left, <clears throat> that vertical axis is displacement. Uh, how much change, a measurement of inches of change of convergence that we've had through, through time, and that's the x-axis, the horizontal axis. So you're plotting displacement versus time. And this is a plot typical of, uh, of a stable area. After it's been mined, these were installed, and this plot begins after it's had its initial uh, response. The initial response, the rates are very high because it, it's, it's just now um, moving into the opening. And then this is the long-term creep, and that's what you want to see is a nice, stable, straight line. Those rates hold the same. Uh, and so that's a, a good thing. One of the issues, though, is, and that's what we look for, is if you see a, an increase in the rate, just like you're driving your car down the road, going 55 miles an hour for forever, it'll hold steady, 55 miles per hour. That's, a, that's a, just like a rate of inches per year, but a little different units. And you want to pass a truck, you step on the accelerator and you go faster. And so if you were plotting that on a graph, you would see an increase, increasing up. When that happens, we know that the fractures have developed uh, enough that, that it becomes a, a concern to us. And uh, typically, we will we'll bolt that to control that, that loosening up of the fracturing. And so it's not always that an increase is, is a sign of instability. A good example of where it's not is if you have a panel uh, that you've mined and you're placing waste in and now you mine the panel next to it 200 feet away, you'll see a response as that as the stress is loaded over to the, uh, the existing panel and you'll see that increase and that's a response not of fracturing <clears throat> but just a stress redistribution as you mine out the, the uh, area adjacent to it. The, uh, the chart on the right here <clears throat> is is a wire extensometer and, and basically what you're seeing is the different anchors so you see more more displacement on the deepest anchor because you're getting all the dilation of the of all the areas and the, and the other the lower ones are anchors that are closer to the collar of the of the hole closer to the surface and so if, in the end if you were able to add all those up you should end up with that that total you know, if you had an inch displacement on the first one that's five feet in and uh, two inches displacement on the, uh, the one that's, that's uh, ten feet in, you take the, 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 five, the one inch that you're out of the first five feet and the next, you subtract the, the, uh, the uh, inch out of the second one and then that's the 20 foot, you can see the difference. So in those different areas of the uh, roof in the stratigraphy, you can see how it's, displaced, how it's displacing and how it's dilating. I guess an interesting thing you see on that, you see the squiggly lines, and that's typical of uh, temperature uh, seasonal variations in the instrument. It affects the instrument because their uh, resolution is so fine, about, a, as I say, looking at about a thousandth of an inch uh, resolution, and uh, it, just the temperature changes in the, in the mine will cause those sorts of, uh, of uh, sine curves, if you will. Again, though, if you see an increase in the rate, <clears throat> you, that may be instability. You'll see, uh, you'll see, though, the same sorts of things. It, it could, it might not be. It may be something that's uh, you're mining that you're doing somewhere else that's affecting that the re stress redistribution, and uh, and we anticipate those sorts of things. These uh, these photos here that you see, this is a uh, uh, measuring convergence. Uh, the geotech, in this case, they're dressed out in anti-contamination clothing uh, and, and wearing respirators. Uh, this is what we're doing in the, in the contaminated area these days. 
uh, they've hooked the exosometer to the roof and they, they've, it's connected down to the floor and he's reading that and he'll read it and there'll be a, another geotech that's recording this uh, information. And then uh, I say, I take it back, the one on top, he, it says he's in a, I guess, I, I guess he is in a clean area. He is, I, I'm looking at, now I, you can't see it up there, but, and I can't hardly see it here, but he, he isn't wearing uh, NICs on the top one, but the bottom one they are. Uh, that's one of the challenges we have these days is, is uh, doing work in, <clears throat> in contaminated areas. Um, There, this data is brought in, it's uh, plotted on those graphs you see, and those graphs are available to, uh, to the geotechs and the engineers uh, on their PCs in their offices. They can bring those up in any place in the mine and see what something's doing, especially if there's a special need for us to go and look at an area for, for a, a concern. First thing they'll do before they leave the office typically is they'll go look at the, at the plots uh, for that particular area and see if there's anything unusual they see in the instrumentation before they go down and look at it visually. It's important for us to, uh, to rely on that, uh, that those things that, that we can see from the uh, geotechnical standpoint from this data. They report, uh, they report weekly. <clears throat> the main report and the, and the customer is operations. We want to know, we want to make sure that uh, that we're being safe and that, and that the mine is being safe. And so they'll report all the areas of the mine and what the geotechnical data show uh, on a weekly basis, that report's issued. Um, they also issue uh, the ground control annual plan. Uh, and that, that is a plan that talks about the, the ground conditions throughout the mine, what they anticipate they're going to be based on what they're seeing in, in, the, uh, in the data and uh, understanding the knowledge of uh, how old the, the, the opening is and also what, uh, what the condition of the ground control system might be. And this data, <clears throat> that, that's specific to the ground control and, and how they will report that. They also report all this data. It's a data dump. This has been done for, I don't know, probably 30 years now. I know it's been done for 25 or so. Uh, in the geotechnical analysis report. It's a, re a required report that's uh, given, uh, it's, it's, it's required by our permit and it's given to NMED on an annual basis. Uh, basically it's showing every graph of every piece of in instrumentation throughout the, throughout the mine. And that's about a, I, I, it, I don't know how big the New York telephone directory is, but this is two or three of them. Uh, it's, 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 it's two volumes and it's, it's, it's hundreds of pages. So based on what they see in the data, we take action. There's three, there's three things you can do in, with regard to ground control if you need to do some action. You can, uh, you can support the, the ground, and that's typically <clears throat> installing bolts or mesh on the roof uh, or the, in the ribs. You may scale the ribs of the roof uh, or, or mill the floor. So as I said, the first thing is, is support it, add bolts or, or something that, that uh, helps support the ground. The second is to, uh, to take it down. If you've got a piece of loose ground, uh, you might be able to bar it down uh, physically with a, with a scaling bar, or, uh, or uh, we have, we have uh, equipment, mechanized equipment, that will scale it down also. <clears throat> so support it, take it down. The final option is, is to uh, leave the area control access, don't go back in there. And, uh, and we've done that through the, through the years. And I've got examples in my mind as to uh, some of the places where we've done all of these things. I brought a couple of roof bolts with me just, just for fun and I hope that uh, if you haven't ever seen a roof bolt, you'll come back up here uh, at some time after the meeting and, and take a look at it. I want, you to, I want you to loft these things and see how heavy they are. The bolts that I brought, I brought a two-foot uh, mechanical anchored bolt, and uh, I guess I'll walk over here and try to do it right. This is a mechanically anchored bolt. Basically, you drill a hole into the rock, you put the bolt in, and then this is threaded here, and this, if you can see, there's a wedge that is threaded also. It pulls that wedge up, 
and these sheaves on either side spread and they lock in on the side of the hole and it anchors. <clears throat> on the other end is a plate and that's a bearing plate and so if it's a roof bolt it's going to go in like this and then they'll spin it up and this will support, this will support the rock and, uh, and that's the typical, that's typical in mining and, uh, and a typical installation. We typically will use uh, mechanical bolts uh, for spot bolting. Uh, they're, they're, we can put them in quickly and easily, at least in uh, non-contaminated areas. It's a little more challenging where we have contaminated areas. <clears throat> and we also use them to install chain link mesh. That's, a, that's the backing for chain link mesh a lot. This is the workhorse that we use here. It's a, it's a threaded bar. And it's got one extra piece on it that, uh, is for my convenience, it wouldn't be on here normally. But this threaded bar, as you see, it's kind of threaded most of the way around. And, and, and typically, the, the, the threaded bar we use and we, when we anchor, these are put in in different in patterns. And the patterns are designed by the ground control engineer to support the dead weight load of what's above him from the, where the roof is to that next layer of uh, where the clay is. And, and then you anchor it into the, the rock above it, into the solid. <clears throat> um, and you don't see an anchor on this. Well, the anchor on this is, is uh, basically a resin bond. It's a two-part bond. And as you spin it up, the threads are such that it wants to push that, that resin up into the hole, not pull it out and drop it out. It wants to push it up into the hole, and it mixes it just like an epoxy is. When you mix it, then you hold it for a, a minute or two. It depends on the, the, the epoxy you're using or the resin you're using. And at that point, then it, it's set. Uh, and you can then put the plate on it and spin the nut up. And uh, leave, it typically has a tail, little tail on it. And after, you, after it's set for a very short time, just a, a minute or two, it'll, have, it'll be strong enough that they have to do, we have to do pull tests and verify the anchorage uh, on, if we're in a new area. Our experience is such that um, the resin that we use, uh, we typically use a three foot long resin uh, cartridge and you, will break, you can break the bolt uh, before you ever pull it loose. The anchor is that good. On these, uh, these mechanicals, the mechanical, uh, typically you'll, you'll be able to yield the, the uh, um, uh, the anchor, but uh, the, the anchors we're using right now, it's, it's, a, it's a race between the two as to whether or not the, the, uh, the steel yields first or the anchor yields. But uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the rating on, on this bar here, the yield point for the you engineers is about, and I'll leave it to the metallurgists to talk about it, is about uh, 45,000 45, pounds, this size bar. <clears throat> Typically, the bars we in place that we install are 12 to 14 feet long. So I'll come up here and lift this one that's two feet long and imagine it's something that weighs seven times more. And that's what we deal with. <clears throat> you see this uh, thing hanging off the bottom? That's a lanyard, and we will attach a lanyard to the, to the bottom. So at some point, if we do uh, break the bolt, if the bolt breaks, and you know, I've told you about salt creep. Creep is happening all the time. And this may support 45,000 pounds, but it, that's, no, that's no contest with, with the geology that's pushing it at the rate it, it pushes. Uh, and so the, 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 the key piece for ground control and for these bolts is to, is to maintain those fractures and uh, control the, the fracturing. <clears throat> and so we do break bolts, and that's common, that's expected. And so we don't, in, in areas, particularly in areas where we have personnel, uh, we will put lanyards on these and they'll be anchored to the chain link and that sort of thing. So if a bolt breaks and it wants to come out, the lanyard grabs it and catches it and, uh, and it doesn't fall. We can see that it's broken and we can replace it uh, and recognize that, but, uh, but the lanyard keeps it from, from hitting the ground. And I won't say it's 100% effective, but it's, uh, it's very close to 100%. So that's the workhorse, and that's typically what we'll use on the roof and the, and the, and the ribs, uh, because the ribs are moving just like the roof is moving, and the floor is moving too. 
Um, and so we may have to uh, bolt the, the ribs. Again, we'll sound it and see if it's drummy. It may begin to, to show a fracture that you can visually see. Uh, and we try to bar, bar, bar those down or scale them down. And in some cases, we just will put chain link mesh down the entire uh, wall there and, and bolt it up with a mechanical bolt. And I didn't say how long we use on mechanicals. Mechanicals, we typically will use a four foot bolt to, to bolt mesh, so it's twice as long as the one I'm showing you. And in spot bolting, they may use a four foot bolt depending on the stratigraphy, or they may use a 10 foot bolt. Those are the typical uh, links that we'll use on those. Um, as I said, the floor moves too, and so, and that's a ground control issue as well. You want to, to operate, especially if you're handling waste, you want to operate on a pretty smooth floor. Uh, obviously, it's not a well, well maintained concrete floor, uh, but we want it to so that it's, it's stable, and so we may have to mill the floor. In fact, they've been milling uh, the, the floors on the waste transport route in preparation for receipt of waste, that we hope at some point in the near future. Uh, and so, <clears throat> basically, they'll mill the, the, the floor, and it, it'll mill as a, as a heave. You'll get a crown on it like you do on a highway. So we have to, we have to cut that crown down and then we'll re-level it with uh, loose salt and uh, do that. And the other, I said those are the ap options to, uh, I guess the, since installing the bolt is supporting, scaling and milling are, are removal options. And, uh, and then if we, uh, we want to uh, restrict it further. If we think that we're not going to get to it because of uh, uh, priorities or that sort of thing, we may restrict the area <clears throat> and continue to monitor it until such time that we believe that we just we just uh, believe that <clears throat> it's uh, the best part of valor is to prohibit that area. Restricted areas are typically uh, just barriered off with a bifold with a sign that that, res that notes whatever the hazard is, and there's some barrier tape that goes with it. And we're trained not to, to uh, cross those, those uh, uh, we read the sign and we obey the sign. If it says do not enter, we do not enter. And if we, if we need to enter for some reason, there may be, if it's just a restricted area, you may be able to go in there, but we want to make sure you know what you're doing uh, and you're properly tra <coughs> trained to do that. And in prohibited areas, we barricade those areas with uh, either chain link or a, or a, or a mesh, a mine mesh. The ground control, whoops, I'm one hit. I think I'm one ahead here. There we go. I guess I punched the buttons too many times. Uh, the ground control engineer will uh, look at the data. And this is, these are the instrumentation engineers and the ground control engineer in concert looking at the data. And depending on what they have, how the, the ground itself is responding, the age of any ground control that's uh, um, installed in the area and that sort of thing, they will uh, place, they basically bend, if you will, into a high, medium, or low priority. Uh, and so that way that gives the flexibility of the operator, the operations folks to uh, to take, you know, work those high priority items off. They may not work them at the, in the perfect order, but they'll take all those highs and what's operationally convenient and they can work uh, most effectively and efficiently, they'll work on those. And, uh, and if something works, something falls out of the schedule or something that they have uh, extra bodies and extra personnel, they may work a medium or a low priority <coughs> in the interim. But the, we focus on those high priorities that the ground control engineer um, identifies and he does that by again evaluating the, the physical observations they go and visually look at it uh, they collect that geotechnical uh, data and they evaluate that data uh, and they base it on their experience and uh, the ground control engineers we got they've got 20 years of experience out there and looking at the ground and, and understanding what's going on <clears throat> uh, I, I mentioned previously talking about lanyards and that sort of thing kind of a graded approach if you have if you know you're going to have a an area where you're going to have folks have personnel located, uh, whether it be a, the, a main travel way, a lunchroom, a, uh, uh, a station where the shaft comes down, uh, we'll make we'll take more care in those areas uh, to make sure that uh, things are secure. And if we get to the point where um, 
we can't uh, meet the standards, safety standards that we believe we've got to have, uh, we'll prohibit the area and, and, uh, and barrier it off. Those are the signs you'll see. As I said earlier, those restricted areas are, in that case, that sign is uh, underground under evacu evaluation. They may be restricted for some other reason. We've had times, particularly after these events, where we were having uh, issues with volatile uh, organic compounds, VOCs, and the gas em emanating from them disposed waste, and we uh, restricted areas for that, uh, so, and we only could enter those if we had the proper respirators, proper control. Again, uh, you may be able to go in those areas if you have a need and you know what you're doing. The geotechs commonly will be able to go in the restricted areas <clears throat> uh, and to, to, for us to continue to monitor. And that's really key is to make sure we're able to continue to monitor. If, we don't, if we're not able to do that, we're kind of blind and we, we, we cannot anticipate what's going to happen as well. Uh, mine operations, when they're going back into one of these areas to recover it, they will typically bolt their way in while they're working their way in under good ground. Uh, and they will also, uh, as part of this, do their, their weekly inspection, they may, they may enter. But those guys particularly are trained uh, to do what they do. And if somebody else needs to go for some reason, they need to be accompanied by somebody that, that is uh, trained and qualified. Under the, uh, the prohibited areas, again, what I said is you, you can't go in. And we physically put a barrier up. In this case, what we'll call it a barricade, and we will typically put a uh, chain link and bolt it to the walls so you can't go in there without cutting through it. Uh, and nobody's going to cut through it. I don't think so anyway. Um, but, and that's typically that's something that we've done when we've, we've withdrawn areas from the active areas. And if the north end of the mine is a good example. When the Santillas experiments were uh, complete, uh, we, we closed those areas and barricaded them off. And, and they remain that way today. <clears throat> this is uh, just talk about ground control status, and I've been I've been mis mistakenly quoting Andy Granatelli. You that are old enough to remember Andy, Andy Granatelli, uh, you'll uh, maybe appreciate it. He, I thought it was he he that said, "Pay me now or pay me a whole lot later." Or pay me, pay me now or pay me later uh, when it came to oil filters. But I, I, I was wanting to be accurate, so I went to uh, Google and found it wasn't Andy at all. Uh, it was the Fram oil filters. It was a Fram commercial. And so you see a guy with a, 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 a oil filter, and he's saying, you know, you need to buy my Fram oil filter and pay me now. And then the mechanic's in the background, and he says, or pay me later. Well, from the standpoint of ground control, I've always kind of used this because my background in ground control, it's pay me now or pay me a whole lot later. And what I mean by that is you need, if you need to go and bolt an area or take care of an area, act, you need to go in and do it when it's easy and the fractures are small, things aren't moving fast. You got to pay me now. And if you don't, it's going to get worse and it's going to be a whole lot more difficult to support as you go through time. And if you get to the point where um, you can't control it, again, you may have to prohibit it. And that may be a, a something you can't, uh, uh, you don't want to pay. You don't want to pay that price. And so as we can, what we want to do is try to stay on top of ground control. And the, uh, the issues we have since the RAD event is we had the RAD event in uh, February of 2014. And we did not uh, get to where we, in a place where we could begin to bolt again until November 2014. Now, I was, uh, I was part of the reentry teams uh, initially. I got to be the field work supervisor. And, and uh, I'll just tell you that was the most fun I had uh, at WIP in my 25 or so years. But uh, it wasn't really fun, but it was challenging and, and it was really gratifying. <clears throat> but the reality is I was asked by the then um, recovery manager when he first came in, the first few weeks after the re that, that, that uh, that event happened, and they, he asked me, what do we need? And I told him, the first thing you need is ventilation, because we need to be able to run bolters. And that's the second thing, is you need to be bolting. We had a, uh, outage, a, a an outage that was scheduled uh, for a, a month-long outage. And some of the areas, in fact, the area where we've had three of those four falls is in 2750. That was an area that was slotted to be bolted in February of 2014. 
we didn't get to bolt it, so it's not it hasn't really been bolted, and that's that's the the result. That's the pay me a whole lot later for uh, for 2750. Um, <clears throat> and uh, what I found, I, and I found it when when I was doing all those. those early entries because we were going in in plastic suits and that sort of thing, thing they were taking a lot of uh, care uh, and even today now I found that what, what used to be a, a typical easy thing to go do to maintain that ground to go bolt and those sorts of things to scale is, is much more difficult because of the fact that you have to wear your um, protective equipment, your protective clothing uh, you're typically in a a respirator, not typically you are in a respirator if you're in the, in the in a contaminated area. And then the reality is we're monitoring, we're, we're carrying instruments with us. Those That crew, they have to dress out, but they also got to carry an air monitor that monitors air quality to make sure that because the ventilation is low that we don't have a problem with air quality. Um, they have to carry a, a, a meter that measures the VOC concentrations, the vol volatile organic compound concentrations, because we have those gases coming from the uh, the existing panels where we have uh, uh, some waste. And they also carry a, a, a portable continuous air monitor to measure uh, airborne radiation, or, or I should say radiation, radiological contamination. Uh, and so they're carrying all these things with them. And by the way, really we've not seen any change in, in anything uh, in the last two and a half years. I mean, from, from that standpoint, we, we, we have relatively good air quality. Uh, we have to maintain the ventilation so that uh, diesel uh, exhaust doesn't isn't a problem. We uh, we may get some depending on the 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 uh, atmospheric uh, what's going on the weather on top. You may have uh, VOC levels that get up higher or lower, but they're not as big of a problem as they were even before the events because now we're wearing respirators. But we still monitor those things, and we've had issues concerning, or I should say, not issues, but folks that were concerned with that, and we had to address those those issues. And and lastly, uh, we have a red contact with us that uh, is carrying a continuous air monitor, uh, and and uh, making sure that we don't have any uh, unexpected radiological releases. Again, we've not seen any real changes in the last two and a half years. But all that being said, it is hard to bolt. It is it's really a challenge to to get in where probably our production, uh, you know, we have to be safe, but I'm going to just talk about production. Uh, it's, it's been cut probably to um, certainly in half, and, and I'd say even to about 25% as to what we would normally do before we uh, uh, had these events. So bottom line is we, uh, we had the rate release in 2014 in February. Uh, we didn't bolt for nine months, and so the pay me whole lot later was in effect, and it was it was working. Uh, and we had areas that that uh, that were needing bolting before the nine months began. Uh, the catch up bolting <coughs> uh, that was needed at that time couldn't be maintained, and uh, again, it create we got the the event created radiological contaminated areas, and we had to address those and have to address those now. And so the recovery efforts at this point are mainly in those red areas, and that's because we're having to pay me a whole lot more now, and that's the that's the challenge that we we face. Talk a little bit about the the roof falls uh, that was mentioned earlier on. The uh, in panel three, that's the one I was mentioning before. That was set. These are not in the panel, but these are in the the drifts that that enter into. The, uh, the panels. So the panel three is filled and 2750 is this drift here. It was the exhaust drift. The ventilation flowed through intake through these rooms and then out and now uh, it, this is the exhaust drift and that's where we saw the fall. That was one of the drifts that was to be bolted in February of 2014 that we didn't get a chance to do that and then when we came back we were focused on things that, that had a higher priority from a personnel safety standpoint. Um, and so at some point, and, and, the, and the, the, uh, the dates are up there. <coughs> we were, actually, I should say what's not up there is this area was restricted before these dates. Uh, the, the, the restriction in, in 2013 was uh, for VOCs because we weren't wearing respirators and the VOCs were typically high enough that we needed to 
to check and make sure that we had the right uh, level of, of air quality before we entered. The initial fall <clears throat> was discovered January 19th uh, of 2015, and uh, the area was it was already prohibited because of, at that point in time, it was VOCs, but we made it, this was prohibited for ground control basis at this point in time. <clears throat> there were subsequent falls on February the 3rd and, and October uh, 3rd, 2016. Basically, this is the same fall. It's not one over here and one over there and one down here. This is the same fall. One was a, a small fall, then it was a little bit bigger, and then it was a little bit bigger. And that's what you see there. That's the subsequence, the, the genesis of the of uh, panel three exhaust drift. And, and I, there was chain link that was tacked to the surface with nails basically, but it hadn't been bolted, so it wasn't supported. Panel four, the area was uh, restricted in uh, March of 2016 and prohibited on uh, September 13th. Again, <clears throat> that initial fall that we saw uh, it doesn't look great. The initial fall that we saw, what we were looking at is they were doing a bulkhead inspection from from the uh, access drift just uh, adjacent to uh, to the area, and uh, the bulkhead had taken enough displacement that it had had a crack that had developed in it, and you could see beyond the bulkhead. It needed to be maintained, and. Uh, you could see on the other side what was suspected to be a ground fall, and we, in the in the end, uh, decided that that's that's probably what it was. Uh, that wasn't the day that they they discovered the the, the bulkhead or took the, but this is the day that, that they went in and took the pictures, and we looked at it and and uh, decided that that, that was, in fact, a, a evidence of ground fall back there behind that bulkhead. And then uh, a little less than a month later, we had the uh, the. Uh, the main fall in that area. Again, same, same fall, the same area, just a bigger, little bigger. And, uh, and then the question's a little bit about uh, panel seven, room five. In my mind, that wasn't a fall. Uh, what we had, we had low angle fracturing, basically a, a fracture that went up from the, uh, the roof into the, into the roof, up, up into the strata and it feathered out to a, a wedge at the edge and they, they uh, felt like that that wedge needed to be scaled down and they used a mechanical bolt, uh, not a mechanical bolt, it was a, it was a scaling machine. It was a, a machine that has uh, bits and teeth and, and rotates just like a mining machine and these bits chip the, the salt loose. Uh, in this case, uh, in this case, as they were driving down through their fully extended boom about 30 feet out there, they knocked down a piece of salt. And that's not a fall in my mind. It, it, was, it was intended to do. That's, that's part of uh, maintenance, maintenance and uh, removing the ground. And so uh, it had been a restricted room back in April, and we've been bolting in there. They had bolted through the room uh, in the July, August time frame, and that's uh, affected the, the the rates in that area and brought them back to what's normal as opposed to that acceleration I mentioned. Um, and so uh, that's just a maintenance item, if you will, in my mind. Uh, it wasn't a, wasn't a fall. Those are the only ones that we've had. Uh, I should say recently we had falls back in the 1980s, maybe maybe it was early 90s, uh, these were allowed to fall in the SPDV rooms in order to monitor that. And that's some of the basis that we've used to, to predict what's going to happen. So the bottom line here, we're not going to do anything if we think we're going to put folks in peril. We're, gonna, we're dedicated to safe operations, and that's just uh, that's just something that we do uh, as a matter of, of course. The, the events of 2014, early 2014, with the fire and the radiological events, um, have made it just very difficult to do ground control, more difficult than it was because of the, the challenges of dealing with a contaminated area. Um, the highest priority is to uh, continue to improve the ground conditions, and we're doing that, um, clearing those, those, those areas away, bolting our way through restricted areas, and, uh, and, and trying to uh, make sure that we um, maintain the ground for the, uh, the mission by bolting those, those waste rooms. 
believe that we've got a robust ground control program, and that's the key piece there. It's not necessarily the bolting. That's only one piece of it. It's being able to, to monitor and predict what's going to happen based on our experience and what we, what we know uh, based on history. And uh, we, uh, we not only rely on those geotechs, but we rely on the miners, those guys that go down there every day to keep their eyes on it and to tell us what they think, particularly those guys that uh, have had experience in the, in the local mines uh, and, and had experience in, in areas that, where the hazards are a little bit higher than what we see at WIP. Just a side note from, from my standpoint, um, I, was a, I was in the geotech, uh, geotechnical engineering uh, management and in the mine, the repository management for almost about 15 years. And um, if I look at injuries, nobody was injured from a ground fall that I can recall in any way, make, or form. Uh, uh, I, I certainly recall the, the man that stepped out of the uh, the porta potty and twisted his ankle, and some of those things. Uh, and we're not we're perfect, but the reality is that that uh, Geotech does a great job, and the miners do a great job. And we understand that we're we're challenged, and we're working hard to uh, to keep to get completely recovered. Uh, we got some more time to go, but uh, I think we're going to get there. So I think we're to the Q and A section. And I, you you had Todd had well, something. Why don't, uh, John, take ground control questions first. Uh, okay. okay. We got any uh, ground control questions in house? I know we got a few on the internet already. Norbert. So you had the roof falls in the entry to no in the yeah in the entry to panel three. Yes, twenty-seven fifty. Right, and then in the. Also, entry to panel four. 3650, yes. Right. The entry to panel four is right next to unmined ground. The entry to panel three is more or less where the, um, where the ramp stops, right? The ramp yeah, the, between it's, it's, panels two yeah, and, and they're three. Both, they're both on the upper horizon, basically. Right. So, uh, but still, the uh, roof fall in the entry to panel three could be sort of explained with that we changed the horizon in that neighborhood, or could could have been a contributing factor. To what do you attribute, to the best of your guessing ability, I suppose, the roof fall in the entry to panel four? Because again, that is right close to unmined ground. You wouldn't really generally expect any trouble there in the upper horizon we have the geology is such that the immediate roof beam just above the where the roof is at about beginning at about 18 inches into the uh, into the roof uh, we have anhydrite stringers that are discontinuous they're not mappable continuous units through the entire area but uh, we've we found that as we uh, mined and, and worked those, that ground in panels uh, three, four, five, and six, those are all upper horizon uh, panels, that, that that was a challenge because we had to bolt those, uh, we had to bolt those uh, near term to keep those anhydrous stringers from connecting up and raveling out. Those falls that I've looked at, as I've looked at the pictures, are relatively shallow falls and getting deeper, and that's typical of, of uh, the fracture development going deeper into those to the next anhydrite string or that sort of thing. I think Norbert's got to follow up here. That's uh, generally all true, but the reason uh, I'm asking the question is because this roof fall could have happened then just about anywhere else in the air in the region of panels three, four, five, or six. But this fall was exactly in the area where, we, where you would least likely suspect it because you got a narrow drift, narrower than, for example, East 140, and to the south of it, there is no more mining. There is nothing but solid ground. Uh, and, and so the key is integrity of ground control. I've explained in a lot of detail uh, the fact that we didn't uh, bolt really over in the 2750. That, that was on target to be bolted. What we found is uh, in, uh, in 3650, and, and, uh, and this is my uh, belief based on the photos and what I've seen, we had a number of uh, roof bolt failures. It wasn't roof bolt failures, it was plate failures. 
Uh, and that was a time that we had uh, uh, the manufacture of the bolts had gone from a grade 60 bolt to a grade 75 bolt. And the plates had not caught up to the string. So it was a stronger bolt. So the bolts lasted and the plates failed. And so when that happened, we didn't have the ground control. Now typically what we would do, if that case, if we could get to it and it was easy, you'd put another plate up on that same tail and, and, and go again and that'd be okay. But in this case, we weren't, we didn't have access and weren't able to do it. Let's go to the internet for a couple of questions. Uh, just to update everybody in our audience here, we've had about 17 to 20 people throughout the evening participating online. Um, I have four ground control questions and then two other questions. Uh, first question on ground control, what is being done to prevent roof falls at the entrances of panels one, two, and six? Um, basically beyond what, what they're, they're bolted there, they are, I'm just looking here, as it stands right now, the entrance of panel one is, uh, is, is, is prohibited and barricaded. Uh, six, we've, we've left the, uh, we've just recently bolted those, rebolted those uh, as part of the NMED, okay, I can, I can point to them. I'm sorry. All right. <laughs> I'm not used to working with a microphone. Not a very good entertainer, sorry. <clears throat> um, looking at the map that's up there right now, panel one. These are areas that are now prohibited and, and barricaded, as is all of panel two, panel three, and panel four. All of those uh, drifts have been, uh, have been prohibited access. Same goes for uh, four, five, uh, uh, and this is showing six. I'm not sure of the accuracy, but this, this one is showing it to be likewise uh, prohibited. I have a conflict between these two maps. This one's current. This, this one is current. This is right. Okay, sorry. Okay. Well, then let me start over. <clears throat> as it stands for panel six, that is prohibited, as is uh, three, four, and five, those entries. The, uh, the South 2520 uh, drift of uh, panel two is prohibited. The other three here for panel one and panel two, uh, 1600, 1950, and 2180 uh, are restricted. Those are, those are at the lower horizon and uh, they're being monitored uh, now, currently, and, and they're bolted. And so at this point in time, we believe that they're safe for entry. Uh, they, they are restricted. And so basically we continue to monitor those. Uh, and uh, if there's a change in, in the geomechanical response, uh, we'll, we may either have to go bolt it if we have the opportunity at that time or prohibit access into those too. Yeah, our second question, are different areas of the underground creeping at different rates? Absolutely. If yes, what has been the maximum and minimum rates and some measure of distance and at what location? Um, absolutely. Every, every location has, is unique. Uh, and so I'll give you the typical rules of thumb. Uh, if the opening has a, a wide span of 33 feet, like a, 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 a a waste emplacement room, it will have a higher, typically have a higher creep rate than one that is uh, 25 feet uh, uh, wide, like uh, East 140. And as you get into like some of the panel entries, they're only 20 feet wide or even smaller in some cases. And so typically that, that has a bearing on creep rate. Um, but also I mentioned earlier in my, in my presentation, there's also the function of age and also the function of, uh, of how the ground uh, um, control is installed. You know, if, it's, uh, if, it's, if we have a robust ground control system in it or not, and it's, you know, if, if, it's, if it's being held up, if you will, by bolts, you don't see the same uh, rates, that, that sort of thing. What was the extent of the damage to the bulkhead in panel four? Was it breached to the extent that it no longer provides integrity? Yeah, it was crushed. It, it, it has no integrity at this point in time. Do you want me to? 
Okay, I'm going to uh, take a couple. Uh, will you ever be able to go back to the location where roof falls have occurred and reestablish ground control there? Are those locations lost, especially in the contaminated areas? I'm especially concerned in areas where panel closure hasn't occurred. I'm just going to say, all things are possible. Pay me a whole lot later. But, but I'll let Todd. <laughs> Thank you, John. Good, uh, good job. Um, that's a question we didn't plant it, but that's a perfect segue in, into where we're going. So uh, over the last uh, few months and weeks, uh, in particular, we've been talking to uh, geotechnical experts from NWP, we've been talking to the workforce, the miners who are down there every day, the personnel who see the place every day, uh, talking to our experts that we may have. And uh, so moving forward, we're now in the process uh, of making a decision to close the south end of the uh, underground. And so if I could show on the map here, uh, again, John mentioned all the roof falls in this area. So the, the decision we are moving into is uh, anything south of 2750, we're going to close now and, and stop going down there. It's going to be a phased approach to that where we, uh, we uh, catalog the information that we need down there. We go in and uh, retrieve any equipment, uh, any services that we need to, uh, and slowly walk our way out of there. Uh, we'd anticipate that being done a uh, few weeks, uh, something like that, maybe, maybe four or five weeks at the most. Uh, then we would install... Uh, more significant barriers in the four main drifts between panels three and two and panel seven and six. Uh, install barriers there, uh, substantial, some kind of bulkheads that would, one, uh, act as a VOC barrier uh, for anything from the south end and, and also, obviously, personnel access. Uh, we'll be looking very hard at what we have to do to prepare the area to get to that. Uh, you know, uh, it'll mean we're not doing ground control at all in those back areas, and we want to prevent anything from propagating to the north. So we'll obviously look very hard on how to protect the ground uh, around those bulkheads. Uh, there's a number of advantages of doing this. One, uh, that will eliminate about 60% of the contaminated, potentially contaminated areas in the underground. We won't have to deal in that area anymore. As, as John said, uh, it, it's not easy. Our, our, our workers do an excellent job in a very... Uh, demanding situation, wearing uh, respirators, wearing anesthes, trying to work in there. Uh, and, and it's just hard, difficult work. Uh, this will take that off the table. It also allows us to route our ventilation a little bit more efficiently, so we can put more ventilation into panels six and seven. Uh, panel seven is the waste emplacement uh, area. As you can see up on the map, it's now has a couple prohibited areas and, and is all restricted, uh, or, or at least being, uh, if not restricted, I'm sorry, being uh, catch-up bolting is being performed in that area. Um, and so this allows us to move the resources we've been using down in the south area up into panel 7 and the areas immediately around it. Uh, so it allows us to really concentrate our resources where we need them for both waste and placement and where our workers are all the time. Uh, so it's a lot of advantages. There, there are uh, one disadvantage in, in particular uh, that would have been an area we had, where we do waste emplacement uh, at some time in the future, either after panel 7 was full or after panel 8 was full. The belief or, or the plan was to go down south and fill those areas uh, and move forward. Uh, we're going to lose that ability uh, south of 2750 by going down this path. Uh, but it's not actually as much as it might seem. There's a little bit of a scaling difference here just on maps, the way they're drawn, uh, just to make it easier to read. But it turns out that entire area south of 2750, the areas we can get to now, the accessible areas, the ones that haven't uh, degraded, uh, actually total add up to just about a room and a half of a panel. Uh, even if we were going to really significant amounts of work, and I'm talking months and months of dedicated work, to recover the rest of that area, uh, you would still only get about three rooms worth of uh, disposal area. Uh, we feel resource-wise, uh, and, and more importantly, personnel safety-wise, we don't need that right now. Uh, we can recover it at some point in the future in other areas uh, or other places we might go in the underground. Um, so, uh, you know, as we've talked about before, our shipping rates are going to be relatively low for the foreseeable future. Panel 7 is going to be more than, a, more than sufficient disposal capacity for us for at least three years. Panel 8 will give us a fair amount after that. So it's many years before we would need that uh, capability. 
we're going to have to work with our regulators, uh, in particular NMED and EPA, to ensure we meet our closure requirements. Uh, and that's going to, uh, going to be uh, some work, uh, but we think we have a plan. Uh, we're going to talk to them. We're going to follow, make sure we follow all our requirements uh, under both the permit and uh, uh, our EPA requirements to protect our, uh, our closure path. Um, but it will be a change, uh, a little bit of a change in what we are planning for the, for the closure of those areas. Um, and, and like I say, over the next few weeks and months, we'll be, uh, we'll be doing that. Um, so we're, uh, the contractor sent us a plan on this. The department is reviewing it. They're implementing some of the uh, 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 actions right now. Uh, we're going to continue to refine it uh, until we get to the best possible path forward uh, that will allow us to stop uh, entering that far south end of the underground uh, moving forward. So and with that, uh, any additional questions or, and or uh, for myself or uh, Phil or, or uh, John, certainly we can take a few minutes left here. Norbert, you got another question? I seem to be the only one in the room um, who has questions. Um, that's actually somewhat of a bombshell announcement that you, that you just made because until roughly a week ago or maybe two weeks ago, uh, we still heard that panel equivalents 9 and 10 were still planned to be filled. So I agree with the rationale, but it's quite a change. Uh, but uh, let me ask you something about that you said earlier. Uh, did I understand, well, and that's the preliminary question, did I understand you right that the location for the new shaft where you're going to drill this 2,150 foot deep core is on the east side of the access road? Yes. West, west side. You said across the road. Which, which road? The, uh, the, the main road in front of WIP itself, so it's the east-west. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, it's, it's west. It's on the west side yes. of the road. Yes. Right, right, right. Yes. Now, um, and, and I mean, in the perspective, it's approximately, yeah. in this area, I couldn't tell you exactly where, but it's approximately right in about here. Okay. Now, um, you, I realize you're just starting with the investigations. You did some soil foundation drilling already in the past, I guess, and this is now the core hole, mm -hmm. and you want to core this all the way from the surface down so you get the whole uh, stratigraphic record. Um, but you're really getting now into uh, a major investment because if that shaft is ever sunk, it, you know, the best estimates are it will cost at least a mil 100 million bucks and possibly 150 or 200. But uh, when you go for that kind of investment, uh, don't you, shouldn't you share with uh, the public as to what is sort of the configuration of your final goal as to where you want to go, where you want to do those, uh, those other panels, etc. cetera. Uh, and um, I heard something during the mayor's task force meeting on Tuesday that about six months ago that uh, internally you did a sort of alternative study on this kind of stuff. Um, if that was really done, uh, what are the reasons that preclude you from sharing those findings with the public? The, uh, I apologize, I was not at the meeting, so I don't know specifically the alternative study, but uh, as we make decisions about the potential to expand in different directions, uh, and, and particularly schedules associated with that, we'll certainly come back and look. I, I think one of the, uh, some of the alternatives we would look at, uh, and, and John could probably uh, chime in, is even the configuration of a panel. It, do we do it right, or, or is there some different configuration of rooms and panels and distances between them? Etc. That's certainly part of the alternative. Um, it's just a little bit premature, I think, to go into a lot of detail right now about that. Do we have one more from the? Yeah, one more non-ground control question. Um, and I'm not sure who the best person to answer this is, but it's about this EORR. Um, in two weeks, contract management team reviewed 950 documents, performed 200 interviews, observed 120 activities, and I assume wrote up everything. Are the write-ups available? And also, the CORR was scheduled for almost four weeks in your PMB. You did it in two weeks. How? So, the uh, the final report from the contract ORR uh, will certainly be available. It, it's still being written uh, right now. We would 
uh, anticipate it sometime in the next, uh, 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 probably end of this week to next week, at least a preliminary version. Uh, as far as the time frames, the most recent time frames we've been working on, certainly within the last six or eight months, was two weeks for the contractor ORR and four weeks for corrective actions from the contractor ORR. Uh, is has been the schedule we've been working since about January or, or since earlier this year. So. Okay, I think that does it. All right, no more questions. How about we talk? Yeah, how about we talk afterwards? Any other questions? All right, appreciate it, everyone. Thanks a lot. Next town hall, probably, what are we thinking? Probably November 6th, maybe? No. Yeah, something like yeah, that, some but, but we'll see. First Thanks. week of November.